Hello, my name is Jerome Ream, and today I am delighted to be able to share with you an application of topological data analysis to navigation in neuroscience. This video is intended for a general audience, and so I'll be keeping things informal, intuitive, and accessible. First, I will introduce you to an idea called persistent homology. Breaking that term down, you can think of homology as studying holes in objects. For example, there is a hole in the shape on the right. Persistence is a reliable way to construct objects from noisy data. Persistent homology produces nice barcode plots, like the one here on the left, that we can analyze. More on this later. We will then apply this idea to try to decode navigational signals in brain data in order to understand how the brain thinks about navigation. My pet name for this project is rodent mind reading, because in a sense, we are trying to read the rat's mind about what it's thinking, where it's planning on going and where it has been, as well as what environment it's in. I will now introduce some informal definitions to give some intuition about the concept of homology. Topologists, like myself, are concerned with the essence of shape. A shape's essence does not change if it is stretched, compressed, or molded. These are concepts we call homeomorphism and homotopy. Suppose we are looking at the shape of a coffee mug, pictured here on the left, and we mold it just a bit into the mug shape here. The essence of that shape has not changed. Similarly, moving to the next shape, the essence remains unchanged. Proceeding around the circle to the donut, at no point have we changed the essence of the shape. Therefore, by the tr transitive property of sameness, we must come to the conclusion that to a topologist, a coffee mug and a donut are the same shape. And in fact, they are. They're both an example of a torus. This idea also helps us answer once and for all the hotly debated question on the internet. How many holes does a straw have? If we have this green twisty straw here on the left, we can transform that shape by stretching it out and molding it into, essentially, a green cylinder. Then that cylinder has the same shape when we compress it into a green ring. And now, that ring obviously has one hole. Therefore, to a topologist, how many holes does a straw have? One. A shape's essence does change if it is glued or cut. For example, if we start with the string pictured on the left and we tie it or glue it into a loop, this is fundamentally and essentially a different shape. It has a different essence of shape than an untied string does. A feature of shapes that does not change when they are stretched, compressed, or molded is the holes in the shape. Holes come in many dimensions. A zero-dimensional hole is a connected component. Shown here are two blobs. Each is its own zero-dimensional hole. A one-dimensional hole is like the inside of a circle. It's a captured disk. A two-dimensional hole is the inside of a sphere. We say it is a captured void. Holes are recorded in the shape's homology. If we are studying the number of holes and how they interact, we are studying the shape's homology. The number of holes in various dimensions is recorded in the Betty number. Betty zero is the number of connected components. Betty one is the number of enclosed disks. And Betty two is the number of enclosed voids, those two dimensional holes. Topologists are interested in the essence of shape, more specifically the holes in a shape. However, most of the time, if we're trying to analyze data, the data does not come in the form of a completed shape. It comes as separate, discrete data points. So given some data points and an underlying geometry, how do we make a shape in order to find the important holes? That's where the idea of persistence is helpful. We would like to pick out the small hole in the upper left, as well as the large hole in the lower right. But how do we form a complete shape? Well, we do what our eyes naturally do and connect the dots. We can form what is called the viatoris rips complex. If two points are close enough, we can connect them with a line. If any triangles are present, we fill them in to make a solid shape. This allows us to capture the hole in the upper left. If we increase the radius, allowing us to connect points that are slightly further apart, the small hole closes up and we capture the larger hole in the lower right. But how do we determine what is close enough to connect? I have a point cloud pictured on the right, and on the left side, I will scan through various R values. We can keep track of the number of connected components in the Betty zero column, and the number of one-dimensional holes in the Betty 1 column. As the radius increases, the number of components decreases as components join up. Here, we actually capture a tiny hole that perhaps you didn't see right away. Increasing the radius a bit more, we capture the hole in the upper left. Continuing to increase the radius, the small hole closes up and we are down to a single connected component. Then we start to capture the large hole in the lower right 
until it fills in as well. The question is, how do we choose the best radius? Well, that's kind of a trick question. Persistence allows us to choose all the values. As detailed in the last slide, when we start gradually increasing the radius, connected components, elements of the zero homology, die as they become conjoined, and holes in the first homology are born and die. Through the structural theorem, this information can be recorded nicely in a persistence barcode. We see an example here. Let's start from the beginning. At a small radius, there are many different connected components alive, represented by the red bars. As we increase the radius, some of the bars end, indicating the components died when, it jo when they joined together. Here, we start to capture that tiny hole. Then the small hole is born. Pictorially, this hole corresponds to this bar. The hole is born a little after when the radius is 0 0.5 and persists until its death a little after 1.2. Continuing to increase the radius, we start to capture the larger hole in the lower right, which corresponds to the long bar in the barcode. Computing this barcode, which is just a matter of linear algebra, allows us to visualize when all the holes are born and die. How do we interpret the data of the barcode? Average persistence in age zero, the connected components, can be used to measure spread, diversity, or clustering. If the average persistence is short, the data points are clustered. If the data points are more spread out, the average persistence in age zero will be higher. I did a video on this last year, applying TDA to professional basketball. For the bars of higher dimensions, indicating one, two, or three dimensional holes, we often interpret the shorter bars as sampling noise, but not always, while the longer bars are usually seen as more significant. For example, the tiny hole dies not long after it was born. We could easily write that off as sampling noise. Maybe if our data points were shifted slightly, the hole would have never formed in the first place. It is intuitive that small changes in the data points will result in only small changes in the bars. In fact, the stability theorem guarantees it, which is why persistent homology is considered robust to noise. The two longer bars in the barcode correspond to the two holes that we would naturally pick out from looking at the point cloud. Presenting the persistence information as a barcode is great, as long as there's not too many bars. If the point cloud was bigger and we wanted to display thousands of bars, the barcode would get a bit crowded and hard to read. We can reorganize into a persistence diagram. A bar and a barcode is nothing more than an ordered pair, recording the birth time and the death time. The bar starts at the birth time and ends at the death time. Instead of stacking bars, we can plot the points on a 2D plane to form a persistence diagram. This is the same information, just presented a bit differently. The long bar in the barcode is born a little after one and persists until its death a little after 2.5. The point in this diagram corresponds with that bar. It's born a little after one and dies a little after 2.5. In the diagram, points far away from the diagonal correspond with long significant bars whereas points close to the diagonal, whose birth and death times are close, correspond to short-lived bars in the barcode. I'll scan through various R values again, and you can follow along in the barcode and diagram. A hole is currently active in the barcode if it intersects the gray line indicating the given radius. In the diagram, the hole is alive if it's in the upper left quadrant, because it's born before the radius and dies after the given radius. The example we just finished looking at was intuitive because the points live naturally in the plane. The underlying geometry was Euclidean. But if our data is more than two or three dimensional or is non-geometric, we can't visualize it. However, to construct a shape and compute homology, all we used was the pairwise distance data. A weighted graph contains all the information we need without the geometry. Here we have a weighted graph pictured with the weights indicated by the colors. Say this graph is some kind of similarity measure between the nodes. Node zero and node one are very similar because the edge weight is high. However, the edge zero two is a weaker, lower weight edge, indicating that node zero and node two are not similar. To have an accurate analogy with distance, where similar things are close and the distance is small, 
we can just reverse the weights before doing our computations. We can compute the persistent homology of a graph in a similar way. Start by connecting the most similar nodes and adding the strongest edge, 0, 1. We can then scan through the edge weights, adding edges as we go up. At weight 5, edge 1, 2 is added and a cycle is formed. The green bar and the green dot correspond with this cycle in the graph. Adding the edge 1, 3 results in triangles being filled in, which kills the hole. Now that we are familiar with the mathematical concepts, I'd like to give you an introduction to some neuroscience. This will just be a simplified overview. As the rat moves down a one-dimensional track, certain neurons in the rat's brain fire at an increased rate. If we know where the rat is, we can track these neural firings and develop a map. A correspondence between the neurons in the rat's brain, called place cells, and the physical locations in the space, called place fields. When an animal is in a specific place field, the corresponding place cell will fire at an increased rate. We also observe neural activity when the rat is resting between movements or is in sleep. These sharp wave ripples are often accelerated sequences of past or future events. We can loosely say that the animal is thinking about navigation, planning where it is going or remembering where it's been. However, we observe more sharp wave ripples than we know how to decode. Are these sequences just brain noise, of which there is a tremendous amount? Or is the rat thinking about a different environment? More specifically, is the animal thinking about traversing a one-dimensional track or walking around a two-dimensional box? This is the main question I seek to answer. Given just the data of the neurons firing, can I decode it in order to decide what environment the rat is thinking about? In order to investigate this question, I simulated neural activity for the animal exploring different environments. First was a linear track. Pictured here is one run of the animal along the track. The animal starts in place field zero, and then it moves to place fields one, two, three, four, and five. The colored dots pictured are where the place cells fired. As you can see, there are some off-colored dots, which represent noise in the data. Here's a depiction of the firing data. The rows zero through five are the place cells. The columns are broken into 10th of a second bins. This run took about 14 seconds. The colors indicate the number of fires in each bin. The animal starts in place field zero, then moves to place field one and so on, with each neuron firing more frequently when the animal is in the corresponding place field. Now suppose we have a sensible way to translate this spiking data into a weighted graph, capturing how correlated the spike times are. I will not give details in this video, but we can see here that edge four, five is the strongest. This is because neuron four and five are the most correlated because they have the most spikes within a short amount of time close to each other. From the weighted graph, we can perform persistent homology to generate a persistence diagram and barcode. As you can see, there is no one dimensional homology. There are no green bars or dots. As we add edges to the graph from strongest to weakest, there is no time at which a hole is captured. This makes sense as the data was from a linear track. I also simulated data from a Y environment as shown. In the run picture, the animal starts in place field four, then progresses to place fields five, three, two, one, and zero. Again, we can construct a weighted graph capturing the correlation between the spiking times. From this graph, we can obtain a diagram and a barcode. Note once more the lack of one dimensional holes. Next, I simulated data for a circular track. On this run, the animal loops around the track, generating the firing data shown. This time, when we construct the weighted correlation graph and compute the persistent homology, a one-dimensional cycle does form. Here we have a rat walking around a two-dimensional box environment, generating spiking data. After we form the weighted graph and compute homology, we see that a hole forms, and dies. I also conducted a simulation where I removed all signal from the data, leaving only noise. In the single trial shown, no cycles form. Finally, as a way of testing my code, I simulated an animal exploring an environment I call the Holy Octagon, incidentally a great band name, but I digress. 
Notice here that the number of place fields and corresponding place cells has increased to about 20. Also, there are two runs shown. In order to get a more robust data set to analyze, I scaled up each environment accordingly. In each of the environments, I conducted 1,000 sessions of 20 runs each. Here, we see a scaled up linear track. For each of the 1,000 sessions, I constructed a weighted graph and computed the persistent homology, focusing only on the one-dimensional cycles, disregarding the H0 connected components. Then I stacked the 1,000 persistence diagrams on top of each other to obtain this diagram. As you can see, the only holes formed were born very late and died very late. Their lifetimes were not long. Removing the very short-lived cycles and applying a density estimate, we can see a heat map. We can view this picture as sort of a topological signature for neural firing data obtained when the animal is thinking about a linear track. Because my rodent lives in a computer and never gets tired, we can do the same thing for a scaled up Y environment, conducting 1000 sessions of 20 runs each, computing the H1 persistent diagrams for each session and overlaying all of them. Again, the topological signature of an animal thinking about a Y environment is rather uninteresting. However, when my cyborg rat does his sessions on a circular track, we do see some real homology. The dots in this region, of which there's about a thousand, correspond to the animal running around the environment and creating that hole. In terms of persistence, the cycle is born early and does not die until nearly all the possible edges are filled in. The signature of a circular track is quite different from a linear track or a Y environment. Now for the 2D box. When my tireless and faithful animal wanders around a 2D box, the resulting stack of diagrams is quite interesting. The semi-random wanderings of the animal produce cycles that have a wide variety of birth and death times. The topological signature of this data is unlike that of any of the previous environments. There is no picture for the random noise environment, but here's a sample representation of the spike data from one run. The diagram stack also shows some interesting homology, as does the heat map. Finally, after a short break, my brave rat conquered the holy octagon. There are three holes in this environment, three obstacles. This results in a clustering of points toward the top of the diagram. The signature of an animal navigating the holy octagon is in some ways a cross between a 2D box and a circular track. After all those pretty pictures, let's remember the motivating question. Given a pile of firing times for some neurons and nothing else, can we differentiate between noise and signal? And can we offer any insight to what kind of environment the animal may be thinking about? The most immediate and common question for differentiating neural activity is distinguishing between a linear track and a 2D box. When we overlay the persistence diagrams for the 1D holes, the answer is pretty clear. The topological signatures for the data collected from thinking about wandering a 2D box and thinking about traversing a linear track are very different. One could do fancy statistics on the set of points in the diagrams or use them as an input for a machine learning algorithm, but I find this picture compelling enough to give me confidence in the technique. Finally, I should mention the efficiency of TDA in this context. When simulating and analyzing the data, the portion that took the longest time was having the rat navigate the environments to generate the data. The persistence computations were very fast and efficient in comparison. Also, they were much faster than other combinatorial optimization algorithms designed to do the same task of differentiating the data types. In summary, we introduced persistent homology to study the shape of data, both in a geometric context as well as a non-geometric one. We learned how our brains think about navigation and applied TDA to help differentiate data. Thanks so much for watching. In order to make this video short and accessible, I omitted many details. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear them. Bye.